Asalaamu Alaikum. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Jinnah Sin University uh, campus as well as the, their alumni in the North America. Uh, my humble thanks goes to them for arranging this program. Also, to all the frontline workers who are working day and night, uh, trying to keep us safe and save as many lives as possible. Uh, what my plan today is to discuss the respiratory failure management in the COVID-19 era. So what I'm going to try to do is, uh, uh, we'll try to address some of the basic things as it relates to the ARDS. Then we'll talk about the mechanical ventilation. Then we'll talk about how we are dealing with the respiratory failure in the COVID times. How our management for the ARDS patient is a little bit different than the, uh, than, uh, the COVID patient. We'll also talk about the proning. And again, we'll talk about how we can split the ventilators. I'll try to show you a three minutes video. If you want to see a detail, let me know. I'll put it out 11 or 12 minute videos for that. The ARDS definition initially came in 1994 with the American Thoracic Society and European Respiratory Society. And later on, it was modified a few years ago and they come up with a new Berlin definition, which I believe it is a little bit better because what they decided was that uh, they change into mild, moderate, and severe degree of the ARDS. And why it is important? Because the mortality is very, very different in those type of population. Definition-wise, it should be acute process within a one week. Uh, patients should have a bilateral opacity. And again, they should not be having any evidence of cardiac failure, which can be uh, based on the echocardiogram or based on the PA catheter or sometime if you don't have it, even the clinical judgment of not having any heart failure or BNP, maybe normal, can do that. Mild ARDS can be someone who has a FPF ratio between 200 and 300 with a PEEP or CPAP of 5. Moderate is between 100 and 200 PF ratio, and severe is less than 100 millimeter of Ig with a PEEP of 5 on a PF ratio. Mortality, as I mentioned, is very different between whether you have a mild, moderate, or severe. Mild ARDS has a mortality rate somewhere between 27%. Moderate has somewhere between 32%, and severe ARDS has a mortality very high with a 45%. If you look at it, the mortality has started to go down, uh, depending on what study we take, whether we take the Mayo Clinic study, we take the alveolar trial, and what really it happens, it all is started when the ARDSnet protocol came in, and what we commonly know is a low tidal volume with a 6 ml per kg. And we are going to discuss this in a moment. In the Mayo Clinic study, what they found was the uh, randomized controlled trial show mortality between 20 and 25 percent, whereas observational study had a high mortality. What we are looking at a lot of these studies, whether we take the ARMA trial or alveolar trial or ALTA trial, as the time goes by when the uh, ARDNET protocol came in around 2000, 2001, we have steadily seen decrease in the mortality, and most of those were based on what we are looking at the uh, kind of a low trial volume. The ARSNET protocol, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2000, where they compared the tidal volume between 6 ml per kg versus 12 ml per kg, and they found a significant difference in mortality, which was 31 versus 39.8%. And again, uh, the vent free days were significantly higher in the 6 ml per kg volume, was 66% versus 55%. And their plateau pressures were also very low, 25 versus 33. On the other hand, what we also do in the ARDS patient, we use a low tidal volume, but we use a very high PEEP. But again, there was a concern that does a PEEP does anything? Does this cause increase in the pneumothorax or bare trauma? The express loves and alveolar trial as well as the meta-analysis showed no difference in the hospital mortality. But what we found was that the higher PEEP was associated with decrease in the ICU mortality and the total rescue therapy and death after rescue therapy was lower in the person who we use a high PEEP. But if you look at the overall instance, uh, there was no difference in the mortality, but death in the ICU was lower in the high PEEP group. There was no difference in the pneumothorax as well as mortality related to the pneumothorax, whether they had a ARDS or no ARDS. Then we come about what mode of ventilation is better, whether the volume control mode is better or pressure control mode is better. Uh, there was a randomized controlled trial which was done. They found there was no difference in mortality, but the people who were going or patients who were going uh, 
and using the volume control ventilator, they had a higher incidence of renal failure. And again, that was a very big challenge. Sometimes what happened is the patient comes with the art, we use a low tidal volume, high PEEP, uh, oxygen. And then what we also sometimes uh, are remaining hypoxic, we do a lung recruitment maneuver. Uh, what you do is you have to do it very carefully, make sure the patient doesn't have a pulmonary lung disease. You go with a PEEP of 40 for 40 seconds, and that helps you open up the alveoli. You try to do the rescue maneuver, uh, not routinely, but if somebody is very severely hypoxemic. Uh, rescue maneuver is also, you know, is very helpful if a patient has a lung D recruitment, like sometimes they are going for a CAT scan or some studies, you disconnect the ventilator when you reconnect, you have lost the recruited alveoli, and the lung recruitment maneuver will help to improve that. Uh, there's another thing which is considered in the prone position, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about prone position when I talk how it relates to our patient. There was a very large Spanish-Italian study with more than 5,000 patients. What they found was that the mortality in severe hypoxemia was decreased in the prone group, and it was 37.8% in the prone group versus 46.1% in the supine group. But the overall 28-day mortality was not really changed. So in other words, it is very important that the patient is severely hypoxemic. And a lot of the time of the patient CT or the X-ray shows a lot of basal consolidation, you can flip the patient. And one of the thing is that most of the time people think that we have to use a rotor prone bed or expensive bed. No, that is not correct. You can just use with a two bed sheet technology and that can be done by three people and two bed sheet, just like your regular bed sheet, what you use in the hospital and you flip the patient. We have had thousands of patients, we have flipped it. We have never lost the central line or the Foley catheter or the ET tube or the ICP drain. And people always have a belief that, well, we are going to flip, we lose the line. But if you want to look at it, there is a very nice video in the New England Journal of Medicine. If you put proning video in ARDS, and actually it will take you to the paper which was published a few years ago, and that shows a three minute video which will be very helpful for you all. Again, the same case is the mortality. There is no difference in the mortality, but again, again, we see that. So now we have a patient who we have tried it on the ventilator, we have done the recruitment maneuver, we did the proning, and it doesn't work, then they can actually go in the ECMO. The best study was came out was a Caesar trial, and they actually show some improvement in the survival benefit. Our experience is the patient is going to the ECMO, or VV ECMO, on the right time, there is some mortality benefit, but if you, have a multi-organ system failure and the patient has a lot of failure, uh, pressors, kidney failures, and all those challenges and the mortality can be high. Again, there are some techniques like inverse ratio ventilation and permissive hypercapnia, which has been used in the arts patient. Uh, inverse ratio ventilation causes shunt reduction and helps to improve your oxygenation. Uh, in some patients who have some pulmonary hypertension and the arts, the nitric oxide may have some role uh, and that can help in the refractory hypoxemia. And that we'll talk a little bit more about the uh, uh, management of the uh, patient with respiratory failure in the COVID, because that has some role which is emerging at this time. Again, the nitric oxide versus IV, uh, inhaled prostacycline. Inhaled prostacycline is much more cheaper. Uh, nitric oxide setup is tough. In our hospital, we actually use a nitric oxide more because we also have a pediatric department and we use a nitric oxide much more than the other one. Surfactant has been tried, but again, not much significant. Also, fluorocarbon uh, liquid uh, assisted gas exchange system has been used, uh, but it is very, very rarely I've seen any centers, even in US, using it. It's kind of a waterboarding. You fill the person along with the fluorocarbon, which can dissolve 17 times more oxygen than water and has a very low surface tension and spreads very quickly over the respiratory epithelium. But again, that is not really what we are using in most of our patients. Now, coming to the mortality in arts, if someone who has a pulmonary organ involvement only, their mortality from arts is lower. But if the arts is because of the extra pulmonary, like a sepsis, then their chance of dying because of the arts or the arts ratio is 2.8. But if they are having a non pulmonary organ system dysfunction, like a necrotizing fasciitis or abdominal compartment syndrome or severe pancreatitis, they have a very high evidence of mortality. So take home point just for the arts before we change the gear. Again, what the common strategies for ventilator for the arts was we were using low tidal volume, we were using high peak, uh, basically on the, uh, I just want to keep uh, above the lower inflection point. 
uh, you, we talk about the inverse ratio ventilation, permissive hypercapnia. Also, we want to keep the plateau pressure less than 30. There is no best ventilation mode. Um, you can use a volume control or pressure control, or you can use the uh, VCPC mode, combining both of the mode uh, and go from there. Take home point, again, recruitment maneuver, only if they're very severely hypoxemic. Proning position, again, it's a very good role in that. Inhale nitric oxide therapy, especially if someone has a pulmonary hypertension. And if you have an ECMO facility, you need to consider it early. Now, coming to the COVID, uh, what are the ICU admission criteria? ICU admission criteria and COVID is not different than whatever ICU admission criteria which you have. It. The patient may require a higher FiO2, their respiratory rate is high, their heart rate is high, their blood pressure is low, their mean arterial pressure is low. If they're elderly with a lot of comorbid condition or they have some respiratory distress or some other uh, age-related factor or immunocompromised status, you may want to consider getting moved to the ICU much sooner. Vasopressor, uh, norepinephrine is a drug of first choice. After that, we use vasopressin. But if you don't have a norepinephrine, you can actually go with the dopamine. Uh, fluid balance, again, conservative fluid balance is the key factor. Now, how to manage the uh, respiratory failure in the COVID era? The National Institute of Health issued a guideline on April 21 of this year. And what they suggested that the initial therapy is usually your conventional oxygen therapy. And if the patient actually requires more oxygen, then you need to have a high flow nasal cannula. And I, I must say that when the China and Italy, when they were having a lot of cases, what they were suggesting is if the patient requires more than six liter oxygen, they just go ahead and intubate the patient, early intubation, early intubation. And what we have realized, and we have gone away from the experience of China, we have gone away from the experience of Italy and New York, that more, uh, most of the patient who goes on the ventilator, they have a very, very high mortality. And what we also found was some of the cases from a postmortem report from the uh, Mount Sinai was a lot of the folks who were dying, they had a microthrombi in the lung just like, uh, you know, uh, they can cause some pulmonary hypertension. So their hypoxia was an issue. Also, the COVID virus were attacking the heme portion and breaking down and disrupting their oxygen carrying capacity. So there has been some changes in that. So, you know, from the conventional oxygen, you're going in high flow oxygen by the nasal cannula. And if they uh, are not able to maintain, then we can go with the non-invasive positive pressure ventilation like CPAP or BiPAP. Patients who have a hypercapnia or have a neuromuscular weakness or have a COPD, obviously BiPAP would be favorable. And we'll go ahead and discuss those uh, further. And the, they were suggesting that the patient who are, have to be intubated, they need to be intubated by the experienced provider. Because what happens is whenever you're intubating, there's a lot of aerosolization and you don't want to contaminate any of your staff or physicians or nurses or respiratory therapists. So you want to do is uh, get somebody who is very good intubation, intubate in the first course. We also do is we use a plastic glass, we put our hand through that, we try to minimize aerosolization. But my feeling would be is just use a clear plastic sheet so the patient face and everything is covered. You put your hand under uh, the sheet so you can clearly see it and you can intubate and try to create a barrier and try to minimize the aerosolization. Now, if they're not doing good on the oxygen, we go for a high flow nasal cannula. And again, that's an option. So I, there was initial concern that when you're using a high flow nasal cannula, you have a lot of challenges like there's aerosolization. So what we suggest is just use a mask over the nasal cannula. Like this gentleman is wearing the high flow nasal cannula. And what you do is you put some mask on the face. Now the high flow nasal cannula is not like your regular nasal cannula. You have the flow meter, you have the tubing, and you have a humidifier. And what it does is it actually takes the gas and it can heat to 37 degrees with 100% relative humidity. And you can deliver the uh, oxygen from 21% to 100%. And you can use a high flow rate up to 60 liters per minute. Now looking at the CPAP mode, uh, we all have used the CPAP. Folks who have a sleep apnea, they also use the CPAP. CPAP can provide the greatest amount of mean airway pressure. That's its most effective recruitment. And you can start somewhere between 15 and 18 and go up or down depending on how the patient does. If your oxygen is improving, patient is getting more awake, then it means that the CPAP is working. If it is going down or patient is becoming more lethargic, then it means it's not working. 
and you should quickly think about intubating the patient. Why the radiation BiPAP isn't that much useful? There was a multi-center trial uh, done in a patient with MERS. 92% of the patients were treated. They failed this modality and required intubation. One of the thing is that if they have a hypercapnia or COPD, again, the BiPAP would be more useful than the CPAP therapy. Now, why they prefer the high flow nasal cannula versus the non-invasive ventilation like CPAP or a BiPAP. In the Florale trial, which was published in New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago, the high flow nasal cannula was found to be superior uh, than the non-invasive ventilation. If you're using a non-invasive ventilation, uh, normally there is a HEPA filter at the end where the, uh, the uh, machine is. We also suggest using a HEPA filter uh, around the mask. This is a, a full face mask. Actually, we suggest like a helmet which covers the whole head and the face. So it tries to minimize the aerosolization. Contraindication to the BiPAP, again, patient can have a poor mental status. Patient can have hemodynamic instability. They can have a vomiting, patient trauma, and all those issues. So you have to be very careful with that. Whenever, uh, if the patient is not improving on the non-invasive ventilation like CPAP or a BiPAP, consider intubation. Mechanical ventilation indication doesn't change. It remains the same. Somebody has a type one or type two respiratory failure, or they're very hypoxic, you want to put them on the ventilator. Intubation, we already talked about it. You want to have the most expert intubating the COVID-19 patient. You want to minimize the aerosolization. You can use a pl plastic sheet that will help it. And everyone should be knowing what they're going to do. So you minimize the number of people in the room. The other thing is that, again, uh, if uh, their mental status is poor, they're vomiting, or anyway, they cannot use the non-invasive ventilation, you need to do that. When you're putting the patient on a ventilator, they will ask you the mode, whether you want to use a volume control or pressure control. They will ask you in the volume control whether you want to use the AC mode or SIMV mode. Always prefer the AC mode. FIO2, I'd suggest always start with 100%, and you can quickly turn, dial down depending on the patient's situation. Respiratory rate, uh, we try to suggest as a backup rate, usually four to six, less than what the patient is already breathing. So if they're breathing 20 times a minute, you can set it at 14. Tidal volume, you want to go with a six ml per kg. Initial studies, they were suggesting four to six ml per kg of the patient body, ideal body weight. But later on, what they're suggesting that, you know, we this COVID respiratory failure is much different than the art, so you may want to uh, consider not using that uh, low of a tidal volume. So you can go somewhere between six and eight, that should be fine. PEEP, again, they, in the ARDS network protocol, you were trained to use PEEP. If they're 100%, you're using a PEEP between 18 and 22. In this case, what do you suggest is to use a little bit lower PEEP between five to 10. Again, if the patient is uh, uh, not breathing at a uh, faster rate, at least he's going to get the set volume. Now, coming to the thing is that um, if you, Intubate the patient. One of the key factors you want to do is you want to listen to the patient breath sound. If you're very good in the ultrasound and you can uh, figure it out what the position of the ET tube based on the ultrasound at the bedside or a point of care ultrasound, you may not need to do the x ray. But most of the time, people end up in doing the x ray. So in this patient, we did the chest x ray. If you see the left side of the lung is totally collapsed and you see the uh, ET tube, which is actually in the right main stem. So what we did is we actually pulled the ET tube out. Now the left side expanded. There's a little consolidation in the left upper lobe. So in this case, you know, we did the ABG in the patient in an hour. pH was 7.36. CO2 was 40. PO2 was 440. What do you want to do? Obviously, you want to cut back on the oxygen. pH and CO2 looks pretty good. A couple of things as a troubleshooting you want to know if your peak and plateau pressure both are going up from your baseline, then it means that you have some bronchospasm, muscle plugging. Actually, I mean, peak pressure goes up and the plateau pressure doesn't go up as much and you have a kink in the tube, bronchospasm or mucus plugging. But if your peak and plateau pressure both goes up a pretty high in an equal proportion, then what you're looking is underlying pulmonary condition like ARDS the pneumothorax, CHF. And if both of them are decreased, it means you have a cough leak. Now, if this is a classic ARDS patient, but this is again the patient we see and uh, someone who has a COVID. So what about the COVID patients? One of the thing is that uh, uh, you have to uh, look at the x-ray. They usually have a 
initial bilateral fluffy infiltrates. I published a paper uh, about a few weeks ago on the radiological findings on COVID, and we described the five stages on the CT scan where initially you have very little infiltrate, and then you start having more uh, fluffy alveolar infiltrate. You have a bilateral consolidation, and then you have a very hyperimmune and cytotoxic uh, kind syndrome, and you actually have diffuse uh, inflammatory uh, cells filling up the alveolar space. And then within two weeks after acute infection, you have a, either patient recover or they start going to the fibrotic stage. So summing up the respiratory therapist management in the COVID-19 patient, you start with the nasal cannula one to six liter, keep the oxygen saturation more than 95%. After that, one of the other thing which is changing intensive care society now are coming up that even the patient who are not on a ventilator, you can actually prone. And what they can do is they can lie on your belly with, for a couple of hours. And if it helps to improve the oxygen, you can lie on the belly and lie on the, your back. And you can alternate while they're awake and it can help them. And it's a very benign thing. It doesn't cost any money if the patient is awake you can just lie on your belly and that would do that. If that is not working, then you can actually go on a high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive ventilation as we discussed. When they're on a non-invasive, if it is, they're sick, one of the thing is if they're going downhill, I would rather suggest intubating the patient in a control setting rather than the patient have a cardiac arrest and you try to intubate. That creates a more aerosolization, that creates a more risk for the healthcare provider. One of the note for caution is when the patient is going through the arrest, make sure that you all get your PPE, wear your masks, wear your gloves, wear your gowns, then enter the room. Don't rush into the patient room because we have seen a lot of the healthcare provider who have not uh, taken care and not wear the PPE. They end up in contacting the disease and some of them themselves end up on a ventilator. You cannot help anyone if you're not well and healthy yourself. So first of all, make sure you gown, protect, and then enter the room. And that is the reason it's important that if you see the patient declining, then you intubate in a more controlled setting rather than the patient going really downhill and they rest and then you run into that. Once you're on a vent, we already talked about it. Once the patient PF ratio is less than 150, you also want to consider proning the patient. And what we do is 16 hours prone and eight hours of fine and that helps most of the time in uh, oxygenation. If that is not is working, then we need to consider VV ECMO if available. But on the other hand, a lot of the time, those patients, as we talked about, that they have a lot of micro thromboemboli in the pulmonary vessel. So what we also suggest is if the patient D-dimer is five times the normal, then we start them on an anticoagulation with a heparin drip weight-based protocol or the anoxaparin at a full dose. So that can help with your some of the uh, microthrombi. But again, if you have developed some pulmonary hypertension, then inhaled nitro, nitric oxide or flow land can be of value. So again, trying to sum it up again, how we are doing the respiratory management. We go with the nasal cannula and after the nasal cannula, we go with the high flow nasal cannula. It does cause increased aerosolization, so make sure you wear a small mask on the patient face so you try to minimize the aerosolization. Tidal volume, we can go with six to eight. In the classic arts, we are using four to six, so you can go with that. Make sure you keep the plateau air pressure less than 30. In the classic arts patient, we used to manage uh, with a very high PEEP. In this case, we are just going with a five to 10 based on the Lombardi experience and Gattinini. That is where we are doing. Lung recruitment, again, when they're very severely hypoxic, you can use it. Neuromuscular blocker only if the patient has a significant machine ventilated syndrome. Prone position when they're very severely hypoxic on a vent, or even a patient when they are not on vent, they're suggesting proning. On the vent, when you prone, you have a 16 hour prone and 18 hour, eight, eight hours of fine. Whereas in non uh, ventilated patient, you're going with two hour prone and uh, then supine and then alternate with that. Again, inhaled nitric oxide or epoprosterol, you can use it. Uh, you can use the nitric oxide at 5 to 20 part per million. Uh, we sometimes even go to 25, uh, 30. Fluid management, do a conservative fluid management. Role of antibiotic is not really uh, clear unless they have a, a super added bacterial infection, and definitely you can treat it. Uh, glucocorticoid role is very controversial. Initially, WHO says no. Uh, Henry Ford data says that it is working, and the NIH came in again 
and saying that it's not working. So again, it's very hocus focus. But if you have to use, and if you have inflammatory markers, uh, I would use the one milligram per kg, but it is very controversial. And ECMO, we talk about it, but again, uh, depend on which center. Uh, we don't know whether it really helps, but again, that can be a last resort. Now coming to, uh, coming to the splitting of the ventilator, I apologize for the typo, it shouldn't be on proning, a con society consensus on the splitting of the ventilator. The main thing is that in US, we have about 500,000 ventilators throughout the US. But there are certain countries like Sudan, where they have four ventilators and five prime minister. You take a country like uh, Central Asia, they have very few ventilators. So what do you do when you're put into a scenario where you may have a very young person or very important person and you have a very few ventilator. How do you do? And I'm going to show you a very simple thing, how we can split the ventilator. It's not the problem in splitting the ventilator from one machine to two people, four people, eight people, or 16 people. It is a question is when you split the ventilator, it is the same ventilator which is delivering the same amount of the pressure and volume to the two, four, or eight patient, depending on how many times you split. And how can you find two people having exactly the same physiology, exactly the same compliance, and they need to start getting exactly improving it at the same time, which is pretty, pretty close to impossible to find. So one of the thing is when you're doing the splitting, you have to sedate and paralyze the patient so they're not taking anything. You put the patient on that, but also make sure it is temporary. You have some plans that there is, somebody is going to flight them out or some ventilators are coming, so you're buying some time. There were several societies uh, which came out consensus together on the splitting of the ventilator. Again, I apologize, there is a typo there. It's not on proning, it's on the splitting of the ventilator. The Society of Critical Care Medicine, Respiratory Care Society, Anesthesiology, Critical Care Nurses, and American College of Chest Physicians all came out and says, do not split. But again, I say that desperate times call for a desperate measure. If you have a very few ventilator and you just want to buy some time for somebody very critical and the help is coming in, how you can split the ventilator. So this is my a very small video. I'm going to show three minutes video on how to split one ventilator into four, uh, initially two and four, but the same thing can be done by adding extension in the same manner to eight or 16. Uh, the full video, I can send it or uh, in the YouTube or some other link, uh, depending on that. We can split the ventilator in two, or two patients, four patients, eight patients. But the key factor is how would you manage the patient while they are a split ventilator. So first of all, what we'll try to do, and Ken is going to help me out too, uh, in case you know uh, we need some help and assistance in combining. But it is very simple. You all are very familiar that ventilator has an inspiratory channel and expiratory channel. And there is a hip catheter attached to both the places. I'm not turning the machine on because once we set it up, then we can turn the machine on and we can see if those are functioning good and if the lungs function and everything is going good. Because if I turn the machine on, then I wait 30, 40 seconds. We have to put the silence button. Otherwise, the alarm is going to go on and saying that the machine is disconnected. That's pretty much useless. Now, what we do is what usually we have in our perfect set. So we have a nice patient who has an endotracheal tube and we have a patient with a tracheostomy tube. Regardless of that, you have the channel, you have a patient uh, connecting it, you have an expert research, and how we do that, you have those tubings, which is very easily available and which can go to instantly. The other thing what you will need is that you will need a HEPA filter for ex extra pre precaution so that you don't contaminate the circuit. This is a Y channel or T cube, what you will need it to make the ventilator split. So, having said that, what we can do is we can start with your inspiratory channel. And first of all, we want to do is we want to connect one to two. So, what you do is you go into the inspiratory loop, uh, put this thing. Guess what? Very simple. Now it is two more. You can take the inspiratory loop. You can go from one, and we can attach it. And that can go, that can go and attach and that can switch to loop. Okay, let me connect that one. 
Here we go. And that is connected there. Where is that? And then there is the second one. And then here we go. It is all connected. And we can connect it to the patient. Um, can, can you do that? One. And that will go in the other one. Uh, there is a blue one will go into that. And you have the one way valve. And the purpose of the valve is to prevent any vacuum. Now, in other words, the instrument loop is set for two patients. So, coming out of the instrument of one, you have a T valve or a Y shaped valve, and you go into two. Now, go into the X ray circuit. You're going to do the same thing. You go ahead and you have a HEPA filter there, uh, so that's additional pr protection, and now we connect to the excretory loop. Uh, here we go. And that will go right over there. And then that one, again, we go to this and we connect it. So, in this way, it is very simple. We have connected uh, one ventilator into two patients. And that patient can be on the vent with the ET tube or tracheostomies, regardless. Now, some of the folks says, can we split the ventilator into four? Sure, we can do that. And what we do is uh, we have this, we take this one T connection, and then we have two another T one. So, in other words, we are going to make almost four part of that and we just connect it right there we can just the so i think you know what we have seen is that we connect it uh, and make the one ventilator into two and then we use the two other tps and the tps in the center make it four we do the same thing in the expiry loop and the inspiry loop and if we want to connect eight we make more loops out of that and they split the ventilator so when you are using the splitting of the ventilator, the volume control mode can be very, very challenging. So I suggest that you use a pressure control mode so you can give the same mean airway pressure. Make sure the patient is sedated, patient is very, very uh, paralyzed, they're not doing it. But again, the challenge is, is that if one patient is improving faster than the other, can we try to get them off? Answer is no, both of them have to come off the same. How we are going to do that, how we can give a different setting that becomes a challenge. And the, the other thing is that is one of the main reasons we don't suggest. And in other words, if somebody has a pneumothorax or somebody has a cardiac arrest, then if you have a four people, you have to disconnect every one of them and start bagging all of them. So that means that there is a lot of aerosolization. There is a lot of risk of contamination. So they suggest no. But in, in the country, like a lot of developing countries that have given talks in Africa, they have a very, very few ventilators. And if they have a challenge with their president or prime minister comes in or some other one comes in or they need to buy a time when somebody very young is uh, sick and goes on the ventilator or somebody doesn't have a ventilator, you feel that you're getting a ventilator on the way in a few hours or six hours, you sure can do that. So in other words, that's not the ideal thing. Desperate measure calls for the des desperate means. Uh, so what we try to cover, we try to cover the ARDS principle. We went over some simple vent setting. We talked about the high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation. We also talk about how we manage the COVID-19 patient, which is different than the regular ARDS. We don't go with a very, very low dial volume and we don't go with a very, very high peep. Also, we have learned a lot lately that a lot of the patients have microthrombi. So we may need to consider anticoagulation on those patients. If they have developed pulmonary hypertension, then we may need to think about that. Role of proning, again, very cheap. When they're not on the ventilator, you can tell the patient to flip on their belly. And if they're on a ventilator, you can use a two bed sheet technique and you can do that. In a very desperate measure, and remember, every single society in the US have advocated against that, but they have several hundred thousand ventilators over the year. But in a place where you don't have it, sometimes if you have to do as a uh, buying time, you can consider doing that. So I think I'd like to stop here. I'd like to thank uh, again, Jinnah Sin Medical University and also uh, their Alumni Association for North America for uh, letting me visit with you all. Uh, hope you enjoy. And if any questions, you can always uh, contact us and we are always there for you. Thank you very much for the office.